We exalt you, almighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords, the name above every name, the name Jesus. Lord, we are grateful today. God, we're just so grateful, Lord, for what you've done for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you became our Lamb of God. You became the sacrifice for our sins, the atonement, the only way for forgiveness, the only way for salvation, the only way for eternal life. You said if we'll believe, if we'll repent and turn from our sins, if we'll follow you, you will wash us clean. If we'll walk in the light as you are in the light, the light of your word, you said the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us continually. If we'll walk in the light. And that is the truth of your word, God. We choose the truth of your word over the lies of man. Mankind has lied. Governments have lied. Space agencies have lied. Intelligence agencies have lied. But your word is true. And you promised that everything would be revealed. And we thank you that the truth is being revealed about everything and it's in jesus name we pray amen and amen somebody say hallelujah, hallelujah. you may be seated this morning wow i tell you what any more folks we have to bring the children up here to sit in the floor like we did during skyfall 2018 we just had them all up here on the floor on sunday morning good to see everybody here today got a lot to cover i want to tell you right now that uh Wow, it's truth being revealed. You know, Jesus said that everything spoken in secret, everything done in secret would be shouted from the rooftops. And then he said, you know, if, if that's true, if we believe that to be true, and I do, then as we are in the last days running out of time, that means there's no more time for things that have been hidden from us to be hidden. Amen. So God is revealing them. Now, some of the things I'm going to get into today, some of you are going to find hard to believe. Uh, but whether you find it hard to believe or not, doesn't matter. If the word of God says it, it's true, regardless of what mankind says. And I'll tell you right now that when it comes to the word of God, I believe it was God breathed, divinely inspired. God moved upon holy men and they wrote exactly what God led them to write. And Jesus made this statement. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That proceeds from the mouth of God. So every word is important. And every truth in the Bible is important. And there's a reason for everything in here. Now, I don't know why anybody would find it shocking that the governments of the world might lie to you about something. <laughs> or that they might mislead you about something. Or that they might hide something from you. Now, before I get into the PowerPoint, I want you to pull up, you guys pull up that scripture, if you would, from Romans 1, and I'm believing it's verse 20. I want to show you that it talks about, and, and we've talked about this in extensive, extensively in my messages on biblical cosmology, biblical creation, or you could call it a.k.a. flat earth enclosed cosmology. But this is what the Bible taught. Now, and for those of you who don't know, I wrote... In 2019, I wrote a 479-page book on both the biblical and the evidence to prove. And the fact, I have in here one chapter, government documents admit flat earth, because in their top secret classified documents, the government has to tell the truth because they have to build things the way the earth really is and how it operates. So they, you know, one of them, like for instance, document 1207, I, I put in here, of NASA, it's a NASA document, technical manual about how linear aircraft or rigid aircraft fly over their words, not mine, a non-rotating flat earth. That's NASA's words in a technical manual, okay? With a stationary atmosphere, by the way, right? So they know how it works. And, and just so you know, Mach aircraft that are flying at Mach 3 or 4 cannot fly at that speed in a curve, whether that curves this way, that way, up or down. They have to fly straight, flat, level. Uh, there's so many proofs to the truth that the Bible is absolutely true when it comes to the nature of the heavens and the earth, creation, the sun, moon, and the stars. Um, but I, I want you to see this right here. 
this is in Romans chapter 1, this is verse 20. He says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let's keep going. Um, back up. Oh, where's the one that says they suppress? They hold these things. Is it the one before or the one after? I have to turn to it myself. I can't, I can't remember now. Huh? No. Nope. Let's turn to Romans 1 so we'll find it. Because this is important. That one we read is important because it goes right along with it, talking about creation. The truth about creation is vitally important. In fact, Satan's lies and the government's lies about creation is what led many people away from believing the Bible and finding Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, yeah, yeah, verse 18. We'll start reading there, verse 18. He says this, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So let's pause right there. The word hold there in the Greek means to also to suppress, to hold down, to hold back. So he says that there would be men who would be holding back truth. They would know it, but they would keep it from you. All right. And the context of this is what we just read in verse 20 again in Romans is about creation because he goes on verse 19 because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them for the invisible thing. Now, listen to this. There's some men that God has showed it unto them. Now, I will tell you this. There's men in our government that have seen in other governments of the world that have seen the evidence at the North Pole and at the and at Antarctica. They've seen it and they hold it back from you. Okay? And he says here, God has showed it to him. So God, God allowed them to see these truths, but they held them. They suppressed them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So what he's saying here is that they, they suppressed the truth because they had other motives, and they were evil, and the Lord is not happy about this. Now, we're going to start this PowerPoint this morning. You go ahead and start with the first slide. I've, I've realized after the last two weeks of digging back into this, back in 2017, I did a message entitled The Mountain of God in the North um, and Christmas. And I, that was, we had sound problems and we had all kind of issues that day. And plus, and since then, there's been so much more information that I've dis discovered. So this is either going to be a two or three part series. This is part one because we have an ordination to do at the end of service here in just a few minutes. But the mountain of God in the north, paradise and Christmas. Um, and I know this sounds wild because most of you don't even know, ever even heard of the, the mountain of God. You don't know about biblical cosmology or creation and again men in power have suppressed this from you but let's i don't know if it's gonna work let's see is that it now here is important to get a hold of this is the concept one of the drawings of biblical cosmology this is what the bible teaches even dr michael heiser the theologian, Ph.D., the guy that came out with Logos Bible Software, teaches a class. Or this is what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation about biblical cosmology, that you have the earth here, relatively a flat-ish type disk. We don't know how deep it goes. Underneath is Sheol, hell, the underworld, also paradise is there. We're going to talk about that. Of course, the foundations of the earth that Job talks about, and of course, Enoch, and that the earth is covered by a molten glass dome called the firmament in which the stars are attached. And upon that, above that, at the very tip top up there, is the waters that are above the heavens, the Bible talks about, and the throne of God up there. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but there's also in the Bible 
And in every culture, the discussion of a great mountain, an exceedingly high mountain in the sides of the north. Now, this is all throughout the Bible. We're going to go through all those scriptures in just a minute. Um, it is talked about in every culture of the world, okay, just like the flood is. The flood, I mean, even in ancient China, the flood is talked about that they, there was a great flood that covered the earth, and there were eight people that survived. Now, isn't it amazing they got those facts right, and they're not Bible-believing people, okay? But just like that the true story of the flood of Noah is in every culture, the true story of the mountain of God that's here on the earth and what is directly underneath it, which is Eden, paradise, is in every culture of the world. Uh, what do the Buddhists call it? Shambhala. They, others call it Agartha. And all of these things that we think, okay, these are just myths, but they're myths that came from truth, Right? These people were passed these stories down, and they didn't have it all right. But guess what? God's word has it right. Now, when you talk about this, that's why I put the star above it. This great black rock that it was been found by explorers and put on ancient maps that I'm going to show you in a minute. This big black mountain called the Rupus Nigra, or some call it, uh, I think in the Buddhism they call it Mount Maru. Um, but... In the Bible, it's called the mountain of God or Mount Zion. Can I tell you that Mount Zion in Jerusalem, that's only about 2,300 feet, is not the exceeding high mountain in the sides of the north. In fact, it's not even north Israel. It's not even north Jerusalem. Right? It's south Israel and south of Jerusalem. No, but this is the exceedingly high mountain, and they say it's magnetic and that's why the compasses all point north. That is the great magnet that pulls our compasses to the north. As well as the fact that ancient uh, discoverers, and I mean like Mercator and others that put on their maps, that people that found it said that they measured the circumference of that mountain at its base at 33 French miles. Another reason that the Freemasons and the high-level occultists like the number 33. But... The biblical cosmology is not NASA cosmology. It's not Big Bang cosmology. It is a three-tiered system. Third heaven above, the firmament, the solid glass dome is the second heaven where the birds fly and where the sun and the moon are actually much smaller and closer to us in here that go move in a circuit. That's the first heaven. But there is also a vast underworld. Okay, and the Bible speaks of this underworld a lot. Now, I want to show you this right here. There's another little picture of what we've been in the North Star is directly above the North Pole, never moves, which lets you know that we're not spinning, flying, vortexing through an ever expanding universe because that star never moves. And, and if you can't figure that out by this star right here that never moves, that Nothing, I can't help you. You are thoroughly, completely government, public school brainwashed. I cannot help you. But folks, you got to think logically. And remember the Bible told us the devil would deceive the whole world. And the Bible told us that the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men would be a part of this conspiracy to deceive us. Okay. And they've deceived us about almost everything. Now, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, we know long time his, his dad was Prime Minister. They have been part of the globalist New World Order agenda for a very long time. Uh, Trudeau is one of the World Economic Forum's uh, young leaders. They've basically filled his cabinet with these Luciferian, Satan-worshipping globalists. Okay, it's just the way it is, that want a one-world government, and they want to control everything. I found this clip. I'm going to just give you the clip. I found the whole speech. I verified this is true. This is not a uh, trick or, you know, a voiceover or anything. This is Justin Trudeau when he was much younger. And remember, he's in Canada, so they're a little closer to the North Pole than we are. Um, and let me tell you something. You've never seen the North Pole. 
I don't care what documentary you've watched, what video you've watched, what pictures you've seen. You've never seen the real North Pole, okay? Um, but we're going to get as close to it as we can here. All right, but listen to what Justin Trudeau says here, and hope we got the volume up. We might play it twice. I want you to listen closely to what he says because he's very young here, but he says when he was much younger that his father and his grandfather took him on a very special trip, very secret trip, to the North Pole. I went on my first official trip. I was going with my father and my grandpa Sinclair up to the North Pole. It was a very glamorous destination. I figured I was finally going to be led into the reason for the existence of this high security Arctic base. It was exactly right. We drove slowly through and past the buildings on a special top secret mission. And that's when I understood just how powerful and wonderful my father was. Oh. Now, why do you think he said that's when he discovered how powerful and wonderful his father was? Because the elites keep this information from you right and they look at that as their the word occult itself means hidden right and they hide things from you and they have the knowledge you don't have so they look at you as the peon as the useless eater right as the one that they are ready to get rid of through depopulation as they're doing now All right but they know these truths and they hold them now let me tell you they know by the things they've discovered, and I'll tell you, we're going to show you this, what they've discovered in the north. They know that God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, is real. That he is the creator. That the earth is just like he says it is. They know the whole truth. You say, well, why don't they turn to him? Because they're wicked. And they have actually believed the lie of Satan, Lucifer, the devil, the dragon, that old serpent. And the Satan has deceived them into believing that they are going to take over the earth, that they are going to get rid of us, and that they are going to defeat Jesus Christ, God Almighty, when he returns. This is why the book of Revelation says that they are preparing to make war with the Lamb, the kings of the earth, all right? They're going to lose this war. They're going to lose in a big way, but they think, and they will think, until he opens the firmament, they will think that they are winning over us, but they are not going to. Now, let's keep going with this. Let's read some verses here. All right. We're going to study the Bible this morning, and this is important. All truth is important. All right. So here we go. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 7 through 15, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Modern science says you evolved from a monkey that they can't show you any proof of evolution of. So you just have to believe that. You did not come from a monkey. God made the first man and woman. He became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground God made uh, the, made the Lord God to grow every, green, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree also of life is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river, remember somebody say a river. A river. A river. Yeah. Went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it parted and came into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and the bedelium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is the Gihon that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is the Hittichel that goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that these rivers are not in the Middle East. There's rivers in the Middle East named after these rivers. But these rivers are at the North Pole. I'm going to show you that in a second. Basically what these rivers are, and let me, let me just go and tell you right now. How many of you know the ocean... The oceans, all the oceans, the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic, in, uh, Indian Ocean, they all have what in them? 
They all have salt. That's good, but it's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm glad y'all know that, though. <laughs> though I will blow your mind that icebergs do not have salt in them. And I know where they come from now. All right? But, <laughs> y'all get me to it. All the oceans have currents, meaning they have a path that they flow. What else has a current? River. Can I just go ahead and tell you that your oceans are not big ponds. They're big rivers. But they start from these rivers. And these rivers start at the North Pole. That's why he talks about they go all around the land of Ethiopia. Well, that was the, he's talking about going all the way around Africa, right? All right. Now, the Lord God took man... And put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, here's what happened. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Even though they had all these trees in the, in the garden, and they disobeyed God. And they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The one tree, he said, don't eat of. Now, God put that. You say, why God put that tree there? Because he had to have free choice. You had to have free will. There had to be an ability to choose evil or choose disobedience. And there had to be choice, free will for there to be true love and true um, a true relationship between you and God. So he allowed there to be. So they chose to, the devil tricked them and Eve and she ate it and then Adam ate it. So it says, the, therefore, it says, well, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as, as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of Eden, the Garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep or to guard the way of the tree of life. Now, there's the, the, the theory, the, the theological theory about paradise and Eden is that God took it away. God took it to heaven. Why would he need to guard it? Why would it need to be guarded by cherubims with a flaming sword if he took it? to heaven he did not take it to heaven eden is still here a place on earth and it's guarded by a flaming sword too you can actually see it okay and he doesn't let just anybody go there there's he's allowed a few visitors to this place on earth trudeau and his group they saw it from afar but they saw it i have the the diary of former admiral bird admiral bird uh, Admiral Richard Byrd here. I just read his entire diary on this subject just the other day. This is it right here. Um, and it says, a secret expedition, journey to paradise inside the earth here. Um, he, he talks about this. Now, he had to keep certain things from us because he was a military man and they threatened him, so he didn't tell us the whole story, but he told us enough that he went under the earth and there is a paradise there at the North Pole. There's no, there's no snow and ice under there. And uh, he met the inhabitants of that land, which we will talk about in part two. All right. Um, but this is some uh, amazing stuff. Now, now let's back up and let's read from Ezekiel 28. We're going to read about both Eden. He, he mentions Eden. Satan had been in Eden, the Garden of God, which is where? In heaven? North Pole, but it's, it's here on the earth. And he talks about Eden, and he talks about this mountain of God in the same context, in the same passage. So let's read this. Ezekiel, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and said to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now this is, he's talking to the king of Tyrus, but Satan had possessed the king of Tyrus. And so he was talking to Satan through him. But he says, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Remember those words. But think about this. He is talking about this mountain of God. Is that in heaven? 
Why would we think it's in heaven? I believe Satan was the covering angel over it, actually. He might even have been like the North Star. Remember, stars are angels and angels are stars. I know that Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't say that, but Neil doesn't know what's really going on. Neil admits that they're 96% stupid. So I agree with Neil deGrasse Tyson on the fact that they are really beyond 96% stupid, but we'll just give them that, okay? But he says, thou art upon the holy mountain of God. Now let's keep reading this. He says, thou was perfect in thy way, speaking of Satan, Lucifer. Actually, y'all, Lucifer's original name was Hallel. I've said this many times, but it was Hallel, and this is in the Bible. You just have to look up the Hebrew word. So you had Michael, Gabriel, and Hallel. Hallel means praise. He was over praise and worship, which is why he had built-in music abilities, which is why he manipulates you with music like he does. All right? He says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, this is your Bible. This is Ezekiel. Um, now, let's read in Isaiah about the fall of Satan. It mentions again the mountain of God, but tells you a location, a direction. All right? This always bothered me because... Because when I, when I believe the earth was a spinning water ball, that, that fairy tale, when I believed that, I couldn't figure this out. It made no sense. Where's the north? How is heaven in the north? How is God in the north? How is the mountain of God in the north? How is, how is there a direction? Here it is. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. If he says, I will ascend into heaven, where is he? Because he's not in heaven. He's here. Satan had a kingdom and a throne here on earth before Adam and Eve. We'll talk about that later. Okay? But he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So that means there's no stars 500 or 5,000 light years away. No, they're all close, smaller. In the firmament, Jesus said all the stars are going to fall to the earth when he comes back. All of them. So how in the world are there massive suns, 5,000 light years away? All this stuff. You have believed nonsense. Nonsense. Artemis, this whole Artemis mission, nonsense. They say Artemis is taking selfies. <laughs> NASA said Artemis is taking selfies. No, it's not. You're watching the movie. You're watching animation. Even Buzz Aldrin, I got a video the other day of Buzz Aldrin saying that when you were watching the moon landing, you were watching animation. I have him saying it. It's amazing because they will crack and say the truth because Jesus said it's a rule. They have to follow. They have to say the truth. They will lie, but they are made to say the truth. All right. He says, for thou said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Everybody say the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. In the north. Where's the north? When the compass points north, where's it pointing? Right. Has nothing to do with a spinning water ball either. It's a big magnetic mountain there. And let me just ask you something. If you're over here on the ball and you got a compass that's a flat thing with a needle, it would be pointing through the earth, not flat. Every instrument we have from the astrolabe to the compass to everything that we have, all the ancients mapped the earth, traveled the earth, navigated the earth with instruments that were flat disc. All of them. That's, that's covered in the book as well. He said, though I'll send above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. But the Lord said, you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, so he tells him right there what's going to happen. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to move on. I'm going to have to get through this quicker here. Now, let's look at these are some verses for you. You can write these down real quick if you want to, but these are just going to go through them. So here I just quoted the Ezekiel 28, 14, and 26, and Isaiah. So they, these are your verses. It says the holy mountain of God in the north tells you, right? We just went through those. Now, let's look at this right here. Here's another one. This is Psalm 48, 2. Now, Psalm 48, 2 says this, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth 
is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Now, when you see, look at this word, beautiful for situation, look up, it means elevation. And I want to tell you right now, the Mount Zion of David, of King David, ain't it. Beautiful in elevation, you know? No. Elevation, I should say. Beautiful, no. Exceedingly high, no. It's a foothill. Okay? And like I showed you earlier, here's Jerusalem, Mount Zion south. I've been there. I've stood on Mount Zion. South again. Here's and, and Judah is in southern Israel. There's nothing about it north. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing about it high or exceedingly high. So the Mount Zion talked about a lot of times in Psalms, the Old Testament had nothing to do with Jerusalem. There's another city. And there it is. There's, it, says, it says beautiful in elevation of Mount Zion. So here's your word. Uh, nof is how you say it. All right. There it is in the Jesenius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, elevation, height. Now, here's some more verses. Psalm 75. Sorry, I'm having to stand out here. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Now, if you look at that, it leaves out the north. Meaning? Promotion must come from the north, right? <laughs> right? God sits in the north. He says that again, the devil taketh him up, speaking of Jesus, when he was tempting Jesus, into, what does that say there? An exceeding high mountain. A 2,300 foot little Mount Zion hill in Israel? No, I walked up that hill and didn't even get tired. No. Exceeding means great. It means chief mountain. These are the words, the definitions. So, let's look at some other scriptures here. Y'all ready? Isaiah 13, 2. Lift up the banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice of them. Shake the land that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I'm going to get into that there's a great army going to come out from under the earth in the north. We'll talk about that later. O Zion that brings good tidings, get thee up into the, the, notice it says the high mountain. Not just a mountain somewhere or a mountain range, not, not some general, the high mountain. There's one of the, the highest mountains, not Everest. Uh, Revelation 21.10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, holy Jerusalem, descending from God. Let me tell you where, where Jerusalem's going to sit. The new Jerusalem's going to sit right at the North Pole. He says, I've raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun, and shall call upon my name, and he shall come upon the princes as upon mortar and the potter. So he's talking about, I've raised up one from where? The north. And he's going to come. Who's that talking about? Jesus. We'll get into more of that later. All right, here we go. Well, there's just so you know, here, here's the highest mountains in Israel. Mount Hermon, 7,336 feet. The rest of them? Small little foothills. So I don't believe it's talking about that at all. Here's your Mount Zion, 2,510 feet. So we know it's not talking about that. There it is. Y'all see that? So it's not Pastor Dean making this stuff up. Finally, you know, for me, I've been studying this stuff for years. Finally, some stuff's making sense. All right, now. Now, here's Enoch. Now, for those of you who don't understand the book of Enoch, just let me tell you why I believe Enoch is... I believe Enoch is truly inspired by God, all right? You can say it should be in the canon or it shouldn't. Either way, I'm, I'm not going to argue. I'm just going to tell you right now. Why I believe Enoch is legit, number one, we found a copy of Enoch 1. Not Enoch 2 and 3. Those are forgeries. Enoch 1 was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least dating it minimum back to 300 B.C., okay? Jesus and the apostles quote from the book of Enoch 1 again and again and again, Word for word, the term son of man that Jesus used for himself over and over and over again in the Bible, particularly in the Gospel of Mark, you can't find anywhere in the Old Testament. But you find it all over the book of Enoch. Jesus did that on purpose. Second of all, or third of all on this, the, the Jude, who was the half-brother of Jesus, and his little book, one chapter, quotes Enoch 1, 
chapter 1, word for word, and says this is a prophecy from Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Where do you get it from? So what I'm going to tell you right now is I believe the book of Enoch is legitimately the book of Enoch, who walked with God and was not, for God took him. And it says Enoch in the Bible, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. And then God took him to heaven. Think about that. 300 years. God showed Enoch some stuff. All right. And I want to show you what I'm going to show you does not contradict the Bible at all. And in fact, it makes some things very clear, but the, it, it goes right along with it. So let's read this. This is uh, and there's different translations of the book of Enoch. You definitely need to look at multiple translations because that's where the problems lie in. Sometimes things different translators translated things differently and some of them got it correct and some of them got it wrong. Um, but chapter 23, what is this? No, this is chapter 24. Let me, let's read this right here. Remember the stones of fire? It said Satan had walked up and down in the stones of fire in the mountain of God. Look what it says in Enoch here, chapter 24. And from thence I went to another place. Now other, other translations of the book of Enoch say that he went to the north. That's why it says up there the seven mountains in the north, west. Now, you got to remember, it's from wherever he was at the time on the earth, he would give these directions. But it says he went to the north. And he showed me a mountain range of fire which burnt day and night. And I went beyond it and saw seven magnificent mountains, all differing each from the other. And the stones thereof were magnificent and beautiful. Now, wait a minute. He talks about stones and these mountains, seven mountains that were on fire. Stones of fire. Goes right along with Ezekiel. And he says here, keep going, he says, and the seventh mountain, look at verse 3, the seventh mountain was in the midst of these, and it excelled them in height, resembling the seat of a throne. And fragrant trees encircled the throne. Oh, what is this place? He says, and amongst them was a tree such as I had never yet smelt, neither was any among them. Nor were there others like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and the blooms of wood wither not forever, and its fruit is beautiful, and its fruit resembles the dates of a palm. Then I said, How beautiful is this tree and fragrant? Its leaves are fair, and its blooms are very delightful in appearance. Then answered Michael, the archangel Michael, one of the holy and honored angels who was with me, was their leader. And he said unto me, Enoch, why dost thou ask me regarding the fragrance of the tree? And why dost thou wish to learn the truth? And then I answered him saying, I wish to know about everything. I <laughs> like Enoch. I want to know about everything. That's me. I, I want to know everything, Lord. He says, but he said, I wish to know everything, but especially about this tree. And he answers this high mountain, which thou hast seen, whose summit is like the throne of God is his throne. Where the great one, the holy great one and the Lord of glory, the eternal king will sit when he shall come down to visit the earth. This is an earthly throne. The mountain of God in the sides of the north is an earthly throne. And literally Satan in Halal before he fell was the covering angel over it when God was there. Think about that. And that this mountain is here on the earth and they're hiding it from you. All right. And he says, and as for this fragrant tree, no mortal is permitted to touch it till the great judgment when he shall take vengeance on on all and bring everything to its consummation forever. It shall be then given to the righteous and holy. Its fruit shall be for food to the elect. It shall be transplanted to the holy place, to the temple of the Lord, the eternal king. Now, look at what Genesis 3 20 says, what? He's guarding the tree of life that if you eat it, you live forever. What did he just say? No mortal can eat of this. Or, right? Not until. Look at what Revelation says here. He's talking to the church of Ephesus, tells them to overcome. And what does he say? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that, that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree which is in the midst of of the paradise of God. Somebody say tree of life is there in the paradise of God. 
Now listen, Enoch goes on to say, this is verse 6 of the same chapter in Enoch. He says, then shall they rejoice with joy and be glad, and, and, and into the holy place shall they enter, and its fragrance shall be in their bones. Listen, to that. their fragrance shall be in their bones. We're going to smell good from the bone. I like that. No more deodorant and, and perfume. And they shall live long upon the earth, such as their fathers lived, and in their days shall no sorrow or plague or torment touch or calamity touch them. Now he's talking about this is the millennial reign. The thousand years, I believe that with all my heart. Because here's, here's Isaiah 65 talking about the millennial reign. He says, when he said, I'll be created new heavens and a new earth. He says, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and the joy of my people. And the voice of weeping shall no be heard, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. So again, he's talking about the people who will live in the millennial reign as regular people. Some who live through the tribulation period will go into the millennial reign and live as human beings. But because of God's power, we will live much longer. We will be able to live a thousand years. But if you're a sinner, you're a curse during that time period. You might not make it that long. All right. Now, if you read in the Bible, you're going to see the word, especially in the book of Psalms and other places, you see the word hill, the hill of God. Let me go ahead and tell you right now. The word hill, it means mountain. If you look up the word translated hill, har, Hebrew dictionaries define as a mountain range or range of hills. The word is used 546 times in the King James translated mountain 261 times, mount 224 times, and hill only 59 times. So when you see this verse, it says hill. It's really the mountain. And he says here, Psalm 68 is a key to all this. If you were taking class, students, this would be on the test. It says here, Psalm 68, 14 through 18, when the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow and salmon. So, first of all, he's talking about a place of snow, when he scattered kings in it. I believe this is talking about the North Pole. He says, the hill of God, or the mountain of God, is as the hill of Bashan, a high hill as or like the hill of Bashan. Well, he's talking about, actually, Bashan was another name for Mount Hermon. If you look at Mount Hermon, pictures of it, it looks like it's covered white in snow, almost year-round. All right? And he says here, Why ye plea ye upon the high hills? This is the hill or the mountain which God desires to dwell in. The Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000 and even thousands of angels. You'll, you'll have to remember that because Admiral Byrd saw the angels there who lived there riding in their chariots but flying in the air. Okay? He said the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Well, how was the Lord in Sinai? It said he descended on Mount Sinai like a fire all right he was there thou hast ascended on high thou hast led captivity captive now this is important when he says thou hast ascended on high thou hast led captivity captive what first comes to mind with that ephesians chapter 4 this is where he paul was quoting it from and what was ephesians 4 talking about he was talking about when jesus died on the cross that day he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. But he did not go into the fiery part of hell where there is torment and torture. The underworld is divided into two places. There is paradise, or otherwise known as the Garden of Eden, or Abraham's bosom. Those are interchangeable names. There's a great gulf, and then you have the place of hell, torment, fire. And Jesus talked about nobody passes back and forth between those two. But this is what it says. This is Ephesians 4, 7. But, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Quoting Psalm 68, word for word here, he said, and then he explains it. Now that he that, that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. When Jesus died on the cross, he said to the thief that repented, 
and believed in him, he said to that thief, today you will be with me in paradise. If, if Jesus, he said today. So if Jesus first descended into the lower parts of the earth, that's what he did first when he died on the cross. And he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise to the thief. Where did they go? Paradise is under the earth. This is Bible, folks. This is not speculation. This is not Pastor Dean going off on a tangent. This is truth you need to know. Because you need to understand how the underworld works and who's going to what part of it. Now here's Ezekiel 31, which is interesting. Ezekiel 31 tells us that Eden is in the nether parts of the earth. So if that wasn't good enough for you, here it is in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 31, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll read from verse here. here. He's, he's, he talks up there about the nether parts of the earth. And he says this, verse 16, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. And this is talking about when he took down Pharaoh. I made the, the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden and the choice and the best of leaven and all that drink water shall be comforted. Where? In the nether parts of the earth, the lower parts of the earth. So he talks about there's a place where people will be comforted in the lower parts of the earth and there's a place where people will be tormented in the lower parts of the earth. There's two parts to it down there. He says, they also went down into hell with him unto them that were slain with the sword and them, uh, they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. To whom art thou like in, uh, to whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet thou shalt be brought down with the trees of Eden unto where? Nether parts of the earth. So there is more scripture connecting Eden to the lower parts are being under the earth. Now let's keep going. Now here's Jesus talking about this, about the, the underworld. And he says here, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and there was a beggar and rich man, and the rich man would never help the beggar, never give him food and let him die. So he was a wicked man. And it came to pass the beggar died and was carried into the, uh, by the angels into Abraham's bosom, or paradise. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell lift up his eyes, being in torments. And he seeth Abraham and Lazarus afar off, so he could see them. Boy, that, that would be torture enough, wouldn't it? To be able to look across and see a wonderful, beautiful place of peace and comfort and water while you're burning and being tormented. This is why he begs for one drop of water. And he cried, said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime you received good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come out from there. This is what Jesus taught. Now, folks, I want to tell you right now, once you go to hell, there's no passing out of there. There's no being annihilated and ceasing to exist. No, the torment, the punishment is forever. You say, well, that's not pleasant to hear, Pastor Dean. I don't care. Jesus said it's eternal punishment. Just like believing in Jesus and turning from your wicked ways you get eternal life. There is eternal punishment. There is eternal damnation. But notice what this talks about is where? This is under the earth. Paradise is under the earth. Now let's keep going. Here's Enoch. Let's read Enoch 22. Remember we just read 24. You back up a little bit. He's talking about these, uh, a great high mountain again. Y'all ready to read it? All right, let's read it. From thence I went to another place, and he showed me in the west. Uh, and, and remember, this is west to where he was, not in the west. But he says, he showed me a great and high mountain of hard rock. And, there, and listen, there were four hollow places, deep and very smooth. So he's telling you, he took me back to the high mountain, 
And there's these hollow places that are deep. Where does that mean? We're going under. All right. And he says, they were v deep and very smooth. Three of them were dark and one bright. And there was a fountain of water in its midst. So the three dark ones were parts of hell. The one that was bright and had water in it was paradise. Why do you think Lazarus, uh, the rich man, was asking for water? He could see it. Here's what Enoch is. Why Enoch is just beautiful. Because it just gives you more of the story. And I said, how smooth are these hollow places and deep and dark to view? Then Raphael, which is one of the angels, answered one of the holy angels who was with me and said unto me, these hollow places have been created for this very purpose, that the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein. Yea, that all the souls of the children of men should assemble here. And these places have been made to receive them till the day of judgment until their appointed period, till the period appointed, till the great judgment comes upon them. Right? Teaching exactly what Jesus taught. And I saw the spirit of a dead man making suit. Actually, this was, we find out that this was Abel. And his voice went forth to heaven and made suit. And I asked Raphael, the angel who was with me, and I said unto him, this spirit maketh suit. Who is it? Whose voice goeth forth and maketh suit to heaven? And he answered, saying, this is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew and he makes his suit against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men then i asked regarding all the hollow places why is one separated from the other and he answered me saying these three have been made that the spirits of the dead might be separated and this division has been made for the spirits of the righteous in which there is the bright spring of water and this has been made for the sinners where they, are, where they die and are buried in the earth, and judgment has not been executed upon them in their lifetime. Here their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the great day of judgment, scourging and torments of the, acu of the accursed forever, so that they may be, there may be retribution for their spirits. There he shall bind them forever. All right. He goes on. And such a division has been made for the spirits of those who make their suit, who, dis, uh, who make disclosures concerning their destruction when they were slain in the day of the sinners. And they has been made for spirits of men who were not righteous, but sinners and who, who were complete in transgression of the transgressors. But they, uh, they shall be companions, but their spirits shall not be slain in the day of judgment, nor shall they be raised from hence. So he's saying their spirits will not be slain or done away with. They're going to be there. And he says, then I bless the Lord of glory and said, blessed be my Lord, the Lord of righteousness, who ruleth forever. And of course, we'll get to this in just a second. Um, let me let me just stop and say this right now. Now, here's what happened. There were there were the righteous before Jesus died on the cross. There were the righteous there. OK, the righteous dead. Their spirits were there. Their bodies were buried in regular just graves, but their spirit soul were there. In paradise the wicked the evil were separated they were in hell in torment when Jesus died on the cross the Bible says he went and preached to the spirits that were in prison now what he's not talking about the wicked ones all right this is so interesting he went and explained the gospel to the ones to the righteous and then he took them from that place to heaven with him which is why you see by you you get to revelation 5 and you see the four elders i mean the 24 elders and you see a great multitude of people and are all there in heaven so these people out here running around the internet going oh when you die you don't go to heaven no no now we do back then before jesus died we did not you either went into paradise under the earth or you went into the lower than that you went into hell now if you die if you're a born-again Christian right with God, ready to die, your spirit and soul go into heaven to be absent with, from the bodies to be present with the Lord. That's what Paul taught us. And he went there. He said, I went to the paradise, the other paradise, in the third heaven. There's two of them. He said, I saw their unspeakable things that man is not lawful for man to utter. But see, now what happens, you die. If you're born again Christian, you go to heaven. But if you die 
unsaved, wicked, evil, a backslider, a prodigal. You go to hell to await the final judgment, which the final judgment is at the end of the thousand years. So meaning when Jesus returns, you still got a thousand years before you get out on bail to go to trial. And that's when you go from hell to the lake of fire. Anybody knows going from county to state prison <laughs> is going from hell to the lake of fire. <laughs> I know. I used to preach in prisons. I know. Thank God I never went. Hallelujah. But now we're talking about the eternal, the eternal stuff. Now, there's been books written and great research done. This is a book right here. Everybody say Paradise Found by William Warren. What's interesting is this guy, look, this book right here, this is one of the originals, $478. It's tempted to buy it, tempted. It's too much for a book, man. Um, uh, but there's free copies online, which you like here, you can go and actually read it online. They actually have it all scanned in. But I want you to see copyright 1885. Um, I'm going to show you who William Warren is in a minute, but he's a professor. But he respectfully dedicated with friendly permission to Professor F. Max Muller of the University of Oxford. We're not talking about crazy lunatic fringe people, right, or conspiracy theorists. These are professors at Oxford and Boston University, let's look at this. There it is. Let's zoom in on it a little where you can see it. And Paradise Found. Notice what the subtitle is. The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole. Meaning the human race that everything began there. And this is amazing. By, look here. Who's William Warren? President of Boston University. Somebody say president. You think he was a kook? <laughs> president of Boston University, corporate member of the American Oriental Society, author of the whatever, I'm not going to pronounce that. And he calls it the true key to ancient cosmology in mythical geography. The true key to ancient cosmology. And I'm not going to go through all this, but the, I, there's certain things I may bring out next week. But he talks about it, all the different cultures. Well, and he firmly believed that Eden was under the earth at the North Pole. And this is what he taught. The human race started there. And he said you could prove it back then. And this is before even going there. Now, y'all remember the Aurora Borealis there. Isn't it beautiful there? I'll give you two things that we know. I think we know what it is. The Bible talks about there being an emerald rainbow around the throne of God. So if the throne of God sits right above North Star, what do you think that green light that's constantly shining around the North Pole is? And remember the Apostle John went to heaven and saw it and wrote about it, a man having never gone to the, gone to the North Pole, always in the Middle East. How could he know that it would be green? How would he know there would be any connection to that? John did not know about the North Pole but he didn't know about heaven. Now, I also believe that the, the Aurora Borealis is the flaming sword that goes all the way around Eden. Now, there's an interesting movie. Anybody remember the movie that came out a few years ago with Samuel L. Jackson? Called Skull Island. Remember that? And it says they're going to find to this secret island that's been hidden. Skull Island. And, of course, that's when they run into King Kong and all these massive creatures and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But what everybody forgets, and I'm going to play a clip of this next week. What everybody forgets, I'm not going to let you hear Samuel L. Jackson talk. No. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, we will mute. But as they're setting up a military base around this island, you see over the center of the island the aurora borealis, yet it looks like a jungle. It doesn't look like ice and snow. 
they letting you know they know. And we know from people who've been there, like Olaf Jensen, that there's massive animals there. Massive. King Kong might be real. But I digress. Come on, babe. Come on. There we go. Now, ancient maps. Um, uh, this is a zoomed in map of a Mercator map from the 1500s. What do you see right there at the center of the, the North Pole? A big mountain. They call it the Rupus Negro, which means the black rock. But it's big. Why would it be on ancient maps but not new maps? Exactly. Liars and deceivers who don't want you to know the truth. Now here, look at this. This is in vintage maps. Old map of the north, 1609. It was actually done before this in the 1500s, but this is just when it was like plated and not put nice. But, but really, after this map, they hide it from you. From this, from this point on, you get no more maps that look like this about the North Pole. So you notice this is a Mercator map here. I just zoomed in on that. You can find all this. Let me get the best picture up here. There you go. All right, notice that in the center you have a whirlpool or a big opening there with water all around it. What do you see coming out? The four rivers. Now, people who have actually been there, there was an expedition. Olaf Jensen and his father, fisherman from um, Stockholm, Sweden at the time, in 1811, went to this place, documented all this. And they were not Bible believers. They did not know any of this. They were worshipers of Odin and Thor. They knew nothing of the Bible. They go there, find the inhabitants who live there, we're not talking about right now, who take them under the earth where they spend two years with these people, most of which were a minimum of 12 feet tall, and to the city called Eden. And in the book, The Smoky God, where Olaf Jensen's story is told, he said the inhabitants of Eden, the underworld, worship the smoky god Jehovah. This is what he said. When they leave after two years, they're still praying to Odin and Thor. These were not Christians. These were not Jews. These were not Bible people. He talks about what he saw there, the massive creatures, the massive trees. He said that the California redwoods would just be underbrush to the trees that he saw in Eden, which what it, Ezekiel 31 talks about the trees of Eden under the earth, that there was another sun there. There was a light. Listen to what he said. Olaf Jensen and his dad said when they were there, that there was some kind of light there that they didn't, lighting the whole place. Hmm, I wonder who that was. And said it made the air feel electric and like you would energized by it. Made you feel alive and strong and healthy. This is the real map of the North Pole. All maps after this started looking like that. 1901 map. Oh, unknown region. <laughs> you know what that is? None to see here, you little useless eaters, you little plebes. You serfs don't get to see what's up here. But Justin Trudeau and his powerful daddy can go see it. Yeah, look at that. Hiding it from you. If it gets any worse, here we go. Who else hides it from you? I'll tell you who else hides this from you. Look at that. North Pole, they got nothing up there. I'm like, man. So they started shutting it down. All right, here we go. But NASA did too. Here's your early Satellune pictures. This photograph was taken January 6, 1967, by the satellite, which is on a balloon, ESA 3, clearly showing a hole at the North Pole. This is a balloon satellite that flew over the North Pole. So the remarkable photograph was taken from SS7. So a little later, 1968, 
Look at it, it's a perfect circle. They don't want you to see what's there. They don't want you to see the mountain, the four rivers, the four hollow places that open up and let you go down underneath. No, all that's hidden from you. But they know it's there because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They keep this from you. They've been doing it for years. Here's another one. Here's, sad, uh, uh, here's pictures. Look at that. It's interesting. In the movie Skull Island, the island they put up looks like this right here. The, the eye is this little black hole they're covering up everything so you can't see it. Because if, if, if they allowed you to see the mountain, what would happen was the satellite, if it wasn't directly over, but just to the side a little bit, you would see a massive structure that reaches heaven, which is what the Tower of Babel was trying to duplicate. Oh, somebody don't shut me down. Notice when this satellite picture was taken. October 3rd, 2008. Well, what's with the circle? What you hiding from me? I mean, this is like, you know, a naughty picture where they, they black out the parts. It's like, you hiding something, right? We, and I'm glad you're hiding it, but I'm not glad about this. See, they hiding something. You only black out pictures you hiding something from. And they've been, look, I mean, 2008. They lie to you, folks. There's Mercator. There's the, another picture of the map. I mean, I got a bunch of stuff. This is what it said. The letter, the, now, the letter written to John D., who was the sorcerer for the Queen of England, the Queen and King of England at the time, he was the one that rediscovered all the occult ceremonies and things. And it's just 10 after, so I'm about to. But he says, in the midst of the four countries, they called these four countries here. He said there was a whirlpool and three of these empty, four in drawing seas, which divide the north. This was a letter in 1577, around the time that the map was made, the real map. A river went out of Eden. This is what Genesis is, a river. That's the river that goes out of Eden. You see that? The whirlpool, meaning, the whirlpool just means it goes all the way around. You want to know about tides? People think the moon controls the tides. No, this place controls the tides. Well, there we go. And then, all right, I'm going to pause here. We'll get to the rest of it later. All right. You say, well, Pastor Dean, why do you do this? Because you know what? You've been lied to about everything, and you need to know the truth about everything. And I think about it, when I start, when, and we'll get into Olaf Jensen's account, we'll get off into more of Ad Admiral Byrd's account of them, what they saw and what they experienced when they were there. But, and we'll explain who the inhabitants are and that whole thing. I mean, it, it's all biblical. But why do we need to know this? And I'm going to tell you why. You always need to know where you came from. And we also need to know the Bible is true about every part. There's no, there's no fairy tales in here. There's no myths. And what, what's amazing is God allows us to find these things and to find out about them. Because he wants us to believe him. Why do you think when, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, and you know, he had appeared to Simon and he had appeared to some of the others on the road to Emmaus, but Thomas hadn't seen him yet. And they're all hanging out, and Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands, thrust my hand in his side where the spear went in, unless I see it, I will not believe. Jesus appears. Poof. Hey, Thomas, come on over here. That's why so many people, look, people want to mock and laugh about people believe in the biblical account of creation that the earth is flat covered by the firmament dome that heaven is above and hell is beneath and people want to laugh and mock at that and i'm like who of you have been to space or the moon 
or high up enough to see anything. You're believing men's stories who say they went to the moon. You hadn't been there, so guess what? You are believing a story. You're believing a tale. But just like Hitler and his men, if you tell a lie, a big one, long enough, show somebody some pictures. Oh, I know they went to the moon because I saw it on TV. Oh, no, there have been people who said, I know they went to the moon because I heard it on the radio. But they're telling you stories. They, because those stories that they're telling you are to get you to believe a certain thing. And God's word has already told you. It's already told you. And I think about this. You know, when, they, when I started hearing, especially Olaf Jensen, who went there for two years to paradise, and they said they let him in because they were of virtue and they were noble people, honest people. And he talks about how beautiful it was and the flowers he'd never seen and the smells he'd never smelled and trees they'd never seen and animals. They said tortoises on the beach the size of, of cars. They said elephants the size of buildings, bigger than this building. Woolly mammoths. Elmer Bird saw woolly mammoths there. And you sit there and you realize the scripture where it says, I hath not seen. Put that scripture up for me. Corinthians. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard. Neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I'm, I'm studying all this. I'm reading all this. I'm rereading the scriptures about it. And I'm like, Lord, I want to go there. I want to see it. I want to smell it. I want to touch it. I want to hang out. They said that under there, it's not just Eden, folks. It's like a whole world of cities under there. One of them named Jehu. Or Jehu, however you want to say it. You say, well, that sounds like a fairy tale, Pastor Dean. No, let me tell you what a fairy tale is. An ever-expanding universe. We're flying half a million miles an hour through the Milky Way galaxy. And I don't feel it moving. Man, that's a crappy ride. I don't even get wind in my face. God's word is true. Let them mock. Because, see, what they don't understand is their faith in their astronauts and their white robe priest with clipboards is a religion. And that religion has led them to taking vaccines that are going to kill them. And it's going to lead them to the mark of the beast and following Satan and the Antichrist all the way until they wake up in hell begging for one drop of water to get out. I could go through, oh, God, folks. You talk about a fascinating study. The mountain of God is there. Eden is there. In fact, it talks about an army that's going to come from there at Armageddon to fight with Jesus, not against him, with him. In fact, now, I've always thought that the king of the north would be some leader here in the world. I think it's probably the leader of the underworld of the good side. They're going to bring an army and many ships out at Armageddon. They told Admiral Byrd they were going to. Folks, all that stuff, just like we found out, all the stuff about giants and creatures, chimeric type creatures, half men and half horse, and we've all thought that all that stuff was just myth, and then they dig one up. 
No, everything about history, those things about history, dragons were real, y'all. What's not just in the Game of Thrones? What do you think that story in Game of Thrones is all about? Now, I didn't watch them. I just watched a, a couple of clips, and I thought, oh, there's giants fighting with them. There's dragons, the seven kingdoms the, of this world. And it was all about getting control over the whole thing. That's what the wicked wants, control over the whole thing. And they're going to think they got it, man. They're going to think we got it. And then the firmament's going to open up, and 100 pound hailstones are going to destroy all of their cities. And the army's going to come from up upon the earth. Great ones, he said. That army in Joel, too? That hitting a, a, a human army? No. I know, I know the stupid uh, IHOP people. Mike Bickle and them, we're Joel's army. No, you're not. No, not even close. You want to talk about taking something out of context? No, you're not. No, but there is one coming. Now, let's pray. I want to pray over this one. And then we're going to do, we got an ordination to do. But I want you to go back. I want you to go look at these scriptures. I want you to study them for yourself. And then we'll get into how Christmas and <laughs> paradise and the North Pole and all this ties in together. Now, I could even freak you out. for I, If I say this, the, the Torah heads out there, and oh, I got some emails to share with y'all next week. <laughs> One word, triggered. I thought about today because I knew I wouldn't get, I, but when I realized I wouldn't get to the Christmas tree part of it and the, and the Christmas aspect, the true history of where it all comes from, I thought about having a Christmas tree set inside, but I knew somebody, some tore head would turn and his head would just pop. <laughs> just pop. And what gets me is they think they're so smart. They don't know history. They think they do. They don't know history. They, they, they know internet. They don't know history. And they're mean. And most of them who end up following, trying to follow the law of Moses when they're supposed to follow the new covenant, end up denying Paul and then they end up denying Jesus Christ. And what's interesting, that one of the emails I got from one of them this past week absolutely says, oh, you know, I like what your truth about this and that, but you're just, your ego is getting in the way of your, you know. Because he knows, right, that Christmas is a pagan holiday, even though that's not history. That's not where it started. Not December 25th. didn't start with pagans. The pagans stole it. And I'll show you all that information ne next week. But he, he was getting all mean. And, and, and by the end, he starts talking about how he doesn't believe the Bible. Yet he's trying to quote me the Bible and tell me how I should. But he don't believe the Bible. All the Bible is inspired word of God. And I'm just like, this is what happens. Let me tell you why you, you, you tore a terrorist out there. Let me explain to you why you end up a Torah terrorist. Because the Bible says, whoever, Galatians says, whoever seeks to be justified, made righteous and holy before God through the old covenant law makes Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the Savior of none effect in their life and the moment too that you start saying things like rob skiba when he was said if you eat bacon you go to hell you start making old covenant things that are not new covenant things requirements of salvation you are accursed and i'm just going to say this skiba and i butted heads for this for several years we both got coronavirus. He's dead. I'm alive. And, I, and you can say what you want to say. I know. I, I, I told him, you keep going down this road. The Lord is going to judge you. Because you are putting forth a false gospel. And these people out here who get so 
mean about somebody celebrating Christmas, hanging out with family, decorating your house with a tree. And let me tell you something, a decoration isn't me carving out an idol to worship. It's a decoration. All right. But these people who get so mean, oh, Christians are pagans. I'm sitting here going, most of them, Billy and I were talking about this. The other, most of them still smoke, vape, drink, cuss, live like the devil. But they want you to keep the law that they don't keep because you can't keep it. <laughs> you can't do it. 613 laws, you can't do it. Sorry, you can't do it. You can't make enough seat seats. You can't eat enough turkey bacon. Can't do it. And I'm not being mean to you. I'm just telling you, you go down that road of that meanness. And let's just say, let's just say Christmas is a bad thing. Let's just go for that for a second. What did Paul say in Romans 14? If one man esteems one day above another day, or one wants to eat herbs and another thinks he can eat meat, who are you to judge one of Christ's servants? These are matters of conscience, not salvation. You don't want to celebrate Christmas? Fine. But don't condemn and curse everybody else to hell because they, they don't do it like you do it. Over a, a holiday that Christians, early Christians, did celebrate on December 25th before Emperor Aurelius issued the decree to create the Unconquered Sun pagan feast on the 25th. In 274 A.D. So hear me. You want to give presents? You want to decorate your house with tree and lights? Let me tell you where it came from. Put my picture back up. Let me tell you where it came from. It came from this picture. The mountain of God with the star over it and the lights everywhere. It's beautiful there. My front room looks like this. In my house, I got even a light that looks like the Aurora Borealis. I'll post it for y'all. <laughs> because you know what? When I saw this right here, it touched my heart. It's like, this is where it all came from. It's beautiful. It's a decoration. When the Bible talks about Jeremiah 10 and these other places where it talks about, you, you take Jeremiah 10, you have to compare with other scriptures. You go to Isaiah. He's talking about the people that cut down a tree and carve it into an idol and cover that idol with silver and gold like they did the Ark of the Covenant, and they worship it and they pray to it. Look, folks, on my book, I have an image of the sun on the front and the moon on the back, but I don't worship the sun and the moon. I'm not bowing down to them. I'm not praying to them. They're not my gods. But there'll be somebody, oh, do you see he's got the sun on there? Oh, God, he must be a Freemason. This is where the psychoticness has gone to. Why is the sun on here? I wanted the sun on here because I wanted to show you the clouds in front of the sun and behind the sun that you can get pictures of so you know the sun is in our atmosphere. It's not 93 million miles away. Same with the moon. The moon, you can see through it. You can see through it on a sunny day. Folks, let me tell you something. You don't land on something you can see through. <laughs> and when you see through the moon and you see the blue sky through the moon, that means it's inside. It means it's actually pretty close. And you're looking through it, and you're seeing the blue sky on the other side. The moon is probably about 70 miles across, maybe less, maybe 32 miles, something like that. But you don't land on something you see through. And that part of it disappears and comes back. It's not the shadow of the earth. I see the sun the other day. The moon was over here, and the sun was up here. It's like noon. And I'm like, what's causing the shadow? <laughs> it ain't the earth. And we, I'm telling you, these are things that we can observe and because we've been so brainwashed. And we've been brainwashed by these Torah terrorists out here. If I see another meme on Facebook, ah, Christmas is pagan. You pagan Christians. Let me tell you something. I went to a Baptist church yesterday. Baptist church. Yes, Pastor Dean went to a Baptist church yesterday. 
saw the grandkids in a little Christmas special. The grandkids were shepherds and angels, and they were doing a little nativity scene, and the choir did their thing. And we're in this church, you know, and we wouldn't, you know, a lot of we wouldn't agree on their doctrine about once saved, always saved, or um, pre-trib rapture and stuff like that. But I know the pastor, and he's sincere. He's sincerely born again, and he's sincere about Jesus. He's for real. And up there on the podium, there's two Christmas trees. In fact, they probably had in the four. They probably had about twenty Christmas trees in the church. But the choir. Little choir, little little church over there, little Baptist church. The choir knocked it out of the park, man. The songs they were singing, the Christmas songs about Emmanuel, God with us. It was the whole thing was Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Worship Jesus. And there were people in the Baptist church standing up, raising their hands during. It. And you got some idiot out here that's evil because there's a christmas tree decoration in the building have you lost your mind the pastor got up and gave a salvation message give your life to jesus and i'm like come on man you you get too far into that hebrew roots torah thing you become mean you become a dang pharisee is what you become and you are so locked in to your brainwashed mind that somebody starts showing you it's not that way. I mean, I get cussed out, folks. Cussed out. You just need your eyes open. <laughs> and some of them are in their 20s. I'm like, do you shave yet? I mean, <laughs> but you're all wise, all knowing. Torah, no, stop, stop. You you go into Torah and Hebrews trying to keep that to be right with God. You are moving backwards, not forward. God is not pleased. You think He is. He's not. Holy Spirit has left you. He's left you to your own devices. He does not bless, anoint, or help you as you go into error and go back into the old covenant law. He does not help you. All right. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. All right. We got an ordination to do. Everybody, want, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Everybody stand and stretch real quick. Just stand and stretch. All right, let's pray, and then we're going to be seated. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. I thank you for the truth that we can find if we dig into the real history and the truth of your word and the freedom of being in the new covenant that we are not bound by all those things from the past, not those ceremonies and rituals and feasts and different garments and food restrictions and all these things you said in the new covenant we're not bound by them anymore we do have commandments in the new covenant and a standard of righteousness that you want us to live and we choose to live that lord we thank you that the truth is being revealed the things that hidden and secret are coming into the open and that we can know that our bible is true it is truly your words from Genesis to Revelation, and even Enoch, we believe is real, Lord, from you. So, Lord, we ask you today, bless your people. And let's just say there's people out there that don't agree. They don't agree about Christmas. They don't agree about Enoch or whatever. We can agree that we believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, who died on the cross for our sins, that rose from the dead, and he is the only way to be saved. Lord, let that be their focus instead of zeet zeets and trying to figure out a sa when the Sabbath is and all this other stuff. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Come on up, babe. All right. Well, yeah, y'all be seated. I'm sorry. Y'all be seated. Just for a few minutes. It's not going to take long. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're going to play something real quick. You go ahead and sit down for a second. We got to play something. Because we're, to Jonathan Moore, Tiffany Moore, they're here and they're with their children today. And uh, they got one on the way. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. So. They're working their way towards a basketball team. Not quite there, but they're going to get there. I told him then after that, then you work toward a football team. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jonathan went through the ministry schools, the first class. He went through that. Uh, so you graduate. I guess that was 2018, but graduation was 2019. And, uh, of course, in the, in the meantime, he used to run a gym in Georgia, and then God led them to move uh, to Arkansas. But I always knew. I knew from the time i got to know jonathan and praying over him it's you know he he was he was security for us too one of our security people at skyfall and um but i knew praying over him and, and his graduation i knew the day would come that god would have him start a church plant a church and so he and his wife tiffany they're going to start a church in arkansas where they live here in the very near future um but we're going to ordain him today as a uh, neophyte minister. I'm going to ordain him to the ministry and to release him to do that. And um, I know he's a man of God. He's a man of prayer. He's a man that hears from God. And uh, he's in for a war in northwest Arkansas because I live there. Steeped in uh, Satanist and witches and occultism there. It's a bad area. Going to have to be very careful about infiltration attempts. Um, but I know God is going to bless and use him and his wife in a powerful, powerful way. And I want you guys, all of you too, and those of you watching and listening out there, our extended church family, I want you to be praying for them because it's, it's starting a church is one of the most difficult things you can do. The warfare is unreal, uh, especially upon the wife. I'm going to say this. It's very difficult. Uh, pastor's wives, y'all have no idea. They go, they are affected by the battle uh, much worse than the husbands are so pray for her because you know women are more relational and want want relationships and i'm sorry but relationships get severed in the church it just happens things happen and things go down and it's it's just harder for them but they also make good pastors and care pastoral care and assistance to their husband as pastors uh, because they do care and see more of the the emotional and the rel relational things that that somebody like me uh -huh, what you know so uh i needed a helper all right i'm like what you're you're upset you're hurting about something <laughs> snap out of it <laughs> but we've got to we've got to play something because some of y'all don't know and jonathan is a very serious guy but he made the funniest video, one of the funniest videos I have ever seen in my life. So today as we ordain him, we have to remind them that he must, in planning this church, do it 110%. Not 100, not even 108. It's got to be 110%. So we're going to play this. <laughs> so y'all can get to know Jonathan a little bit. He does have a sense of humor. Go ahead, roll the tape. <laughs> morning y'all i'm finally going to do this video because i keep getting so many messages and, and comments and y'all are always asking me uh brother john how do you how you kill so many big old deer or uh brother john how how you catch so many of them big old fish or uh, uh brother john how how do you how'd you kill all them bears and um the answer it, the answer is simple y'all it's because i always give 110 <laughs> percent And it's real frustrating because nowadays nobody gives 110%. And people think that just because you give everything that, that you have, all they think if, uh, that 100% is good enough. And the truth is, it ain't. Give 100% and then think you're going to do anything. Anything less than 110%, 0%, in my opinion. Well, Brother John, that's a little bit harsh right there. Well... You want to be a winner or do you want to be a loser? Because if you want to win, you're going to give it 110%. All 
I've had some young fellers talking about, well, Brother John, I gave it 110%. And then you look at them, you can clearly see they didn't give any more than 107, maybe 108% at best. It's disgraceful. Brother John, how'd you catch that 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 big old shark with your bare hands? Hundred and ten percent. Brother John, I don't know how to give hundred and ten percent. It's easy. Okay? Give your all and then add ten percent to it. Okay? How much deer pee should I put on? A whole bottle plus ten percent of another. Y'all didn't hear that. He said deer pee. Basic How much deer pee? scales anymore these days with the whole common core nonsense. <sighs> well, Brother John, how much should I tithe at church? Well, 10%. But if you do 110% of 10%, that would be 11%, wouldn't it? Disgraceful. Brother John, how'd you win all them football games? Well... Catch the ball in the end zone, run it back 100 yards. Uh, it don't count if I don't run 10 more, does it? 110 yards is a touchdown in my books. Disgraceful. Y'all out there need to start learning how to do 110%. The world would be a lot better place. You know, if he wasn't going to be a pastor, he might have a job as a comedian. <laughs> um, I want to get ready. I want to play the GMA Prophecy real quick. Because um, I played this at every graduation. Some of you have been to Fire and Grace School of Ministry graduations, and I play this. This, this prophecy, and see Brother Matei right now, this prophecy is not just over me, it's over you. And this prophecy was from D November 19th, 1989, it was one of the truest prophecies I ever got, and uh, I'm I'm watching it come to pass now with you guys, and you guys that are stepping up and going forth and teaching others and setting other people free, and um, but we'll, let's let's play that and then we'll we'll do this. Yeah. Hallelujah, Lord! I thank you for this, brother. And I thank you for the commitment. You know, brother, this is what I see. I see you before God. And I see you kneeling there before the Lord in an absolute contrition, absolute dedication unto Him, just putting your life there, saying, God, it's yours. And God's taking you up on it. God's placed a calling upon your life. God's going to have you teach. There's a teaching anointing that's going to come upon you that will be very powerful in the body of Christ. God says a teacher in my fivefold ministry you will be because of the things that I'm stirring inside of you. This is not a day of release, but this is a day of preparation for you. But there will be a day of release when I will launch you and I'll push you forth, says the Lord. And you will walk forth in my anointing and my power. And you shall teach. But they shall not be the things that all would expect. But they will be the things of God that will set and the captives free and liberate my body to be what I've called it to be. For you will train many others that will go forth. And they too shall teach. And they shall break the strongholds of the enemy by that taught word, says the Lord. Amen. So, brother, you're going to break the strongholds of the enemy. And I just, it's its been my honor and privilege to have you in our school uh, as part of our extended church family. And I know you'd be here every time if you could, but it's an honor to uh, ordain you. Now, if y'all can, y'all come on up. I'm going to lay hands and come on, babe. Um, yeah, the whole group can come up. Um, the doctrine the Bible talks about in Hebrews the doctrine or the ministry of laying on of hands 
And the doctrine of the ministry of laying on of hands is for, for three reasons. One, baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? You, it's how they ministered the gift of tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, for healing and also for ordination into the ministry. And so uh, Paul laid hands on Timothy, and he said, by that, you go forth. Paul, before he left, even though Paul had been with Jesus for three years in the wilderness, he was at the church of Antioch. And they fasted and prayed, and the elders anointed him, and the Holy Spirit sent them out. So that's how we do it. Um, I know God's going to bless you. I know there's going to be battles, but you're going to win. You're going to win those battles. And uh, but let's do it. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name, and I thank you for Jonathan and Tiffany and their whole family, Lord, this precious family that you have blessed them with, Lord. And God, the anointing and the calling that's upon their lives, both Jonathan and Tiffany, Lord, you have called him to be a pastor now, and his wife's called to be with him. And Lord, I know that it's scary stepping out into new areas and uh, into an arena that they haven't been in before, but Lord, it is your anointing and your grace and your power that does it. And where you call, Lord, where you lead you provide the grace, the strength, the anointing, the fire, the power, the gifts, the understanding, the revelation. So, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, as a, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as an apostle, as a prophet, as a fivefold minister, Lord, I lay hands on my brother right now in Jesus' name. And, Lord God, I ordain him, Lord, to go forth as a pastor in the name of Jesus Christ, as a teacher, to go forth and to plant this church and to, God, not just plant it, but grow it and establish it. That it would be a light and a witness to those in Arkansas, Lord, and to the whole nation. And, Lord, I ask you right now to bless him. And, Lord, as a minister, I bless him. I bless him and his wife and his children right now. We bless them in the name of Jesus. We pray that you cover them in the blood of Jesus. We pray that you add now angels round about them that will defend and shield them and protect them. I pray now, Lord, that there will be even a greater experience of the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you will increase the spirit of wisdom and revelation in him and upon him. Wisdom to know what to do and when to do it. And his wife to be their discerning and hearing and being a confirming voice or a warning voice but to be a voice in his life, to be that helpmate, Lord. And, Lord, I just bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, you have raised him up. You have called him for this last time, for these last days. Hallelujah. I just feel like I'm supposed to pray in the spirit over you, brother. And the Lord was saying to you, my son, you are a warrior. And I have called you that. That is your name, warrior. And you will war for me in the spirit. And you will set captives free by my word, by my anointing, by listening to me and following me. I will bless you and your family. I will protect you and your family. My hand is upon you, and it has been upon you before you were even born. I have ordained you and called you for this hour and for this time. Never doubt. Never fear. Never worry. I will provide. I will provide what you need. I will give you my grace. I will give you my spirit. I will increase my anointing upon your life from this day you will see an increase of the anointing revelation understanding the gifts of prophecy word of knowledge word of wisdom will begin to increase in your life lord i thank you for this i thank you for this
for both of them. I thank you, Lord, for anointing my sister, Lord. Lord, I thank you for her heart. She loves you. She loves your word. She loves the truth. She loves her children. She loves her husband. And she is going to be a fierce protector of all of them. And Lord, I ask you to fill her with your peace and your strength and your courage and your fire and your power that you'd be with her in childbirth as she's about to have another child. Lord, protect her and that child. And we pray all this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for them. And we know, God, great things will be done through them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Love y'all, man. Couldn't be more proud of you. And boy, y'all are beautiful. Y'all like a little a picture. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Um, I just have a, a real, real quick word that I believe the Lord gave us uh, for right now. When I reached out to Pastor Dean and we scheduled this day, I um, had some kind of mixed emotions. You know, obviously I was real excited. Um, but then, you know, as soon as, as soon as you go to step into anointing and step into, you know, whatever the Lord calls you to do, there's going to be those voices, you know. So as soon as I reached out to him. I started feeling excited, but then I also started hearing these these words. You know, you don't have 35 years in the ministry. You don't. Have, you know, I've been going around for seven years trying to find churches close to where I lived to find a a, a true shepherd, a true man of God that was protecting the flock. And you know, that's why people come from all over the country here to see this man, as he's anointed and he's actually preaching the whole word. So I'm hearing these voices saying. You know, who are you? You think you think you're going to do it better than all these other, you know, these other pastors that you've been visiting. You don't have the wisdom and, you know, you're you don't have the the polished presentation and, and, and all this stuff. Right. So I'm just sitting there and the Lord gave me a vision of standing in front of you all right now. And um, I was standing there and I didn't know what to say. And I just felt kind of kind of foolish and like. Lord, what do you want me to say? What would I say to the people? And I just heard 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. He said it four different times to me. I said, well, i got to look it up, right? Um, and I don't have it memorized, but I'm, I'm going to read this to you all real quick. Um, because it was an encouragement for me to go out and, and start this church. But then a few days later, when Pastor Dean started sharing that the Lord was putting on him, that y'all are about to go into a season of evangelism here in this town. Y'all about to hit the streets. And I knew that this word that I saw in a vision in front of y'all was not just for me and us starting the church, but it's also for y'all in the, the season that, that um, y'all are coming into. Because I assume, like when I first heard him saying, we're about to hit the streets, for a lot of people, there, there's probably at least a couple of people in this room that were like, oh, that, I don't know. That's, I'm scared of that, right? I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know what to say. I'm not the man of God. Like, what, what am I going to do out on the streets, right? So y'all listen to uh, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 through 5 really stood out to me. And it'll all make sense. Look, I'm like a little bit nervous even, right? And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, you know, if... um. If y'all don't feel like you've got, you know, a Ph.D. at some seminary to back you up when you hit the streets, then good. That means that the power of God can be shown and his name will be glorified. So I just want to encourage y'all as y'all are going into this season. I believe that the Lord gave me that that word to encourage me when, you know, the uh, unclean spirits try to show up and discourage you from from doing what he tells you to do. But also to be an encouragement to y'all as you go into this next season.
One more thing. Hold on. Well, I have a little something. We have a little something for the children, for all three of them, but I wrapped it in pink since you have two girls at this point and one point. And something for Miss Tiffany. And the card that I pulled out this morning is a special card because my sister actually made these cards. She drew these. And it says on the front, cast out into the deep, Luke 5, 4. And I wrote this for Tiffany because it was going in her bag, but it's for both of you. And we keep hearing grace, his grace. And the, the scripture that I put in this was 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Of course, we know his grace is sufficient for you. And that's the word for both of you. But I especially was dedicating that to Tiffany because as women, we tend to feel like we always fall short. And I just wanted to remind you as a pastor's wife, it's tough, but his grace is sufficient for you. You're not doing it in your own strength. So I'm going to stop there because y'all are so sweet and I love you. And I'm starting to cry. So. Amen. Th this is how the Christian faith has continued for 2,000 years, right? The New Testament church has continued men teaching the next generation and passing the baton, and that's the way it works. So find your Timothy as well. Amen. All right. God bless y'all. Hallelujah. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around and being patient. Um, sometimes we have baby dedications, and <laughs> sometimes we have ordination. Huh? And Bucko, come here. Bucko's leaving us. This is his last Sunday, though doesn't mean he can't come back and visit. But is there anything you want to say? Well, uh, truth be told, I pretty much a guy that gave it 105% all my career and then I I was shamed into 110 percent and that's one reason I'm doing what I'm doing and this is the hardest part is I love all you guys the the church family I was I'm glad I cried earlier because now I don't have to now I just say good, goodbye but God's called me on to something else he uh he's been working this thing in me of uh laying down my life picking up my cross and following him and now he's like, this is the ultimate test. I'm going to give you a woman to deny yourself. Because it's one thing to be on when you're at church, Wednesday night, prayer, on the street, whatever. But day in, day out. So he wants to get rid of Bucko. And uh, that's the, I see the way he's doing it right now. So I'm on the way. Well, let me pray for you. Come on. Father, we thank you for Bucko, and we ask you, Lord, to be with him in this journey, Lord, to Arizona, and Lord, not just uh, the situation with the new person in his life, but Lord, as well as the ministry, the, the prison ministry there, and Lord, we just pray, God, that your blessing and your anointing be upon him, and that you use him mightily, God, with her, with her family, and also, Lord, in that prison there in Arizona, on, that you will move in a mighty way, that the anointing and power and fire of the Holy Ghost will just increase and flow through my brother and that you'll use him uh, to set captives free, Lord. And we thank you for it. And we bless him and pray you protect him as he journeys out there, as he drives to Arizona. Lord, put your angels around him and keep him safe. And we thank you that you sent him our way for the last few years and the blessing he's been to us. And, Lord, we just, again, we pray for you to bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. All right, we'll say bye to our viewers out there. Thank you all for watching and listening. And then we have some just in-house quick. Oh, Skyfall will be, registration will be up pretty soon. But prepare for Skyfall 2023. It'll be June 2 through 4. Uh, in LaGrange, Georgia, at the same place that Skyfall 2020 was at the Callaway Conference Center. Uh, but be preparing for that and go to skyfallconference.org is the website. 
uh, for information there. But you guys get ready, prepare. I saw, I saw people saying, I'm putting in for my vacation already. So, uh, so people will be coming. We're going we're gonna to have a good time. All right. God bless. <laughs>